All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is Mayor Khalid here in Atlanta's new Twin City, South Fulton, Georgia. And welcome to the first in a series of conversations uh, that I am calling uh, Courageous Conversations. Um, we're going to, over this series, uh, talk about some really important issues in our community. I'm just going to make sure that our tech, um, my that, that our tech is it is working. Um, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing the screen. Tech uh, one, there we go. Great. So yes, welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for coming to this first in a series of conversations. Um, these are town hall conversations uh, designed to give us more time to talk in depth about the issues underneath the issues uh, that we debate so vigorously oftentimes in our council meetings. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about open records, uh, open government. And at the end, I'm going to, you know, just we're, we'll have a, some free time. I'll take questions from the chat and uh, everywhere else that um, people may have questions. We have a YouTube chat. Our YouTube chat is live and is working, um, unlike our, our city council meetings. That's the first section of open government. But right now, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over because we have a lot of information to cover. I do want to, again, uh, give a special thanks to the folks at uh, both uh, let me start with, I want to give a special thanks to the folks at the South Fulton Coalition and many of the members of the community. You know, we tried to have this conversation in a council meeting with the Georgia Municipal Association in a work session, um, and it was removed by a vote of council. But many of you were so interested that you reached out, you found the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, and uh, they're going to provide this training to you now. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, the, the Georgia First Amendment Foundation is being supported by the University of Georgia School of Law. So thank you to both of these incredible institutions. Um, let people know also, before I, before I turn this over, let people know um, that they can be watching this, share the text message. Hopefully everyone is text Fulton to 33777 so they can sign up uh, to see all these things. This is streaming on YouTube and also on my own uh, page, ColleagueCares.com. So just tell people to go to ColleagueCares.com or go to the YouTube page. And this will be up even after today. And we'll find a way to take more questions even after today for folks uh, who have further questions. If you, if you look right under the, I'm gonna share my screen and just show one thing. All right, so if you're on ColleagueCares.com, you'll see it streaming right below here. You'll see a RSVP, and I'll change that to a question link. It will take you to a form. So if you have questions about open meetings or open government, uh, please continue to send your questions here. If we don't get them to them today, uh, we will pass this along to the Georgia First Amendment Foundation. So I wanted to show you that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our amazing trainers. Thank you all so much. Let me unmute myself there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I really appreciate you inviting us uh, today. Uh, with me, I'm Richard Griffiths. I'm uh, one of the board members at the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, a former president. Uh, I uh, retired uh, about six years ago, seven years ago from CNN, where I've been for uh, 26 years, uh, overseeing editorial quality control. I now lecture on free speech, open government, journalism, ethics, and editorial quality control in the US, uh, Eastern Europe, and uh, uh, other places around the world. Uh, 
Uh, I also teach at the University of Georgia and uh, UNC Chapel Hill uh, as a guest lecturer on uh, open government and transparency issues. Joining me uh, much uh, more qualified than I am are Claire Norens, who is an attorney, a clinical professor, and director of the First Amendment Clinic at the University of Georgia School of Law. In private practice, she has represented plaintiffs in both individual and class actions on First Amendment issues and other constitutional claims, focusing mainly on issues of policing and employment. She served as an assistant attorney general for the state of New York in the Civil Rights Bureau and also as an assistant director of the University of Georgia's Equal Opportunity Office. She is also with me, a board member of the Georgia First Amendment Foundation. Also joining us is Alison Viley, who is a legal fellow with UGA's uh, Law's First Amendment Clinic. She is a 2021 graduate of Duke Law School and a member of the District of Columbia Bar. She was previously a litigation associate with the law firm Ballard Spar, where she represented clients in a range of complex commercial disputes. While in law school, she was a student attorney with Duke's First Amendment Clinic. And she also externed at the North Carolina Office of the Solicitor General and spent a summer working with Earth Justice in Florida. So we've got three parts to, or four parts to our training today. Uh, the first one is on open records. The second one related to open meetings. Uh, law enforcement specifics uh, is the third one. And uh, social media policy, the fourth. So let's uh, start. Uh, let me share my screen if I can do that. And we're off to the races. So um, let me just first say that unlike my other two presenters, I am not an attorney. I'm a journalist by training. But none of the work that we're doing today should be seen as anything more than general legal information, current as the date it's given. It's not intended to be legal advice from either the First Amendment Foundation or the First Amendment Clinic. So everything that we're going to cover today can be found on uh, the guides to court access to open records in the Georgia law enforcement and in the Sunshine Laws uh, booklets published by the Georgia First Amendment Foundation. All of these can be found in digital form at gfaf.org. So everything we're pretty much going to be going over today related to open meetings, open government, uh, and law enforcement can be found in these three guidebooks, which can be downloaded in PDF form at gfaf.org. You can also send us a few dollars, and we'll send you printed copies of, of these books. So what's the basis of open records and open meetings law in Georgia? Well, it comes from the Georgia Constitution. It comes from state common law, and it comes from the two acts that are very specific, Open Records Act and the Open Meetings Act. Chief Justice Charles Weltner uh, summed up the importance of open records uh, when he wrote the opinion that vigorously reaffirmed Georgia's open records policies in a, the case of Davis versus the city of Macon back in 1992. And he wrote, because public men and women are amenable at all times to uh, the people, to the people, they must conduct the public's business in the open. They must conduct the public's business in the open. So everything that you do as public officials uh, must be conducted in the uh, open with some exceptions that we'll get to as we move through this. Georgia's open records law itself 
has a preamble and the preamble reads, it is the strong public policy of this state in, to be in favor of open government, that open government is essential to a free, open and democratic society. And that exceptions of this law, the open records law, shall be interpreted narrowly. So when there are exceptions to the law, they must be interpreted very narrowly. So what are some of the specifics of what's covered? Well, any agency, commissions, councils, boards, city councils, school districts, subdivisions uh, created by a branch of government, that would include committees uh, of your city council. Uh, Nonprofits receiving a third of funds from government sources, private entities that carry out gov government functions. So if the City of South Fulton has an entity that manages the water, for example, they would be uh, held accountable under the Open Records and Open Meetings Act for functions that they perform on the behalf of city government. What's covered? Records. Well, that could mean all kinds of things, couldn't it? Documents, data, letters, meeting makers for things like this session we're having today, maps, books, tapes, photos, any kind of emails, data, personnel records, zoning records, electronic files. Did I say email? Zoning records and decisions, budget reports, and any drafts of reports. Let me stress that. So a report that is final is one thing, but also drafts of that report that are prepared, they are also considered to be public records and accessible for the public to read and see. Digital stuff, that includes electronic data, including emails and text message. So email keeps coming back up. And while the statute doesn't specifically say uh, text messages on private phones, the AG's office has taken the position that all email and all text messages generated uh, related to the agency's business are open regardless of whether they were generated from a personal account. So if a city councilman or a public employee is doing the city's business on their personal phone, the contents of the personal phone related to that business are considered open to a request from the Open Records Act under the, re under the recommendations of the Georgia Attorney General's office. So what's the process of seeking records from your agency from the city council. Well, written requests are not required under the law, although we at the Georgia First Amendment Foundation and the First Amendment Clinic both recommend the public submit written requests because it avoids confusion. But the public is not required to do so except in one area, and that is if the records requested are related to some kind of litigation. And then they must be in writing. And they've also got to be copied to the attorney of record for the agency. So the city attorney, if you're if there's litigation involving some record uh, that is uh, held by the city council, the city attorney must be uh, copied on the open records request. Nothing changes otherwise, other than they need to know about it. All public records are presumed to be open to inspection and copying, which means that there's nothing to say that somebody just couldn't come in if the record's easily available and use their phone and snap a picture of it. They don't even have to, you don't even have to make a photocopy. Uh, they can uh, make their own copy with their phone. The agency can require that all written requests go to a de designated person, someone called a records custodian. For big agencies, that really makes a lot of sense because it helps coordinate the traffic. But it doesn't get you off the hook uh, for the time you have to turn it around to the public. So there's a three-day rule. 
uh, for providing records to the public, records that are readily available, i.e. not in storage, nothing that's going to require redaction, and we'll get to redaction and, and exceptions in a minute. They need to be made available as soon as possible. There's no waiting for the three days to run before you turn them over or respond. No three-day business wait. But the three-day business rule gives the agency a deadline to let the person know when the agency can provide the records if they're off-site or they're electronic or uh, is that in that file box that we sent to storage last month? Uh, and also tell the person how much it's going to cost if it's going to be a big deal to pull all those records and cite any exemptions of records to be are to be withheld. The key thing is you have three business days to cite if you're going to withhold any records or withhold uh, portions of those records and, and what you are going to be withholding them for under the law. Well, what are some of the exemptions to disclosure? First of all, you're never going to get OGA, the UGA mascots, veterinary records. Uh, veterinary records and medical records are exempt for, for disclosure under the Act. So are records of law enforcement, prosecution, or regulatory agencies in any pending matter. So if there's an investigation underway, prosecution of criminal or unlawful activity, uh, those records can be held except for initial police arrest reports and initial incident reports. And I'm going to get into a lot more detail on this shortly. Records of rec programs. Uh, the legislature felt it's probably not in the best interests of folks to be able to get a hold of the names and addresses of every 12-year-old playing Little League. Uh, so anything that includes ident identification, identifying children uh, 12 years or under by age, name, and address, that's protected under the statute. Uh, and then uh, for those of you who might use uh, your Peach Pass to come into Atlanta or head to the northern suburbs, uh, the Tollway Authority doesn't have to turn over your transit data to uh, anyone simply requesting it under the Open Records Act. Now, law enforcement can get that data, but open records requests are protected for your travel records on state highways. So other exemptions include income tax matters or income tax information that are confidential under state or federal law. Note that property tax records are always public in Georgia. Personal information collected by agencies and is not public and includes your social security number, your mother's birth name, financial information, account numbers, your credit card data, insurance or medical information, unlisted telephone numbers, and dates of birth. Those are considered private. So sometimes water authorities keeps track of some of this stuff in order to uh, extend credit. Well, they can't turn that over uh, under an Open Records Act request. Public employees are also protected for disclosure of social security numbers and birth name and financial information, some financial information, account numbers, uh, insurance and medical Again, unlisted phone numbers, dates of birth. But it doesn't cover job applications, performance evaluations, disciplinary action, personnel files or salary. Those are all open and transparent under the Open Records Act. There is one caveat to the exception on dates of birth and social security numbers, and that is if a news organization needs to cross-check that there's a Richard Griffiths who's been naughty and they're doing an investigation on them and you've got the records on that scoundrel Richard Griffiths. But there may be another Richard Griffiths who perhaps uh, is Mr. Dursley who uh, starred in a uh, 
uh, a series of fabulous uh, movies. And you want to compare the two to make sure you've got the right Richard Griffiths who you're exposing for shenanigans. Uh, under the law, you may disclose that so you, the news organization can make sure that they have the right person in their reporting. Uh, they, you could make it an agreement that they not broadcast that date of birth or social security number, but only have it for news gathering purposes. So there, what about these redactions? Well, if there are to be redactions to cover things like social security no numbers or mother's maiden name, they have to be made by the lowest cost qualified employee who works for the agency. So somebody qualified who maybe is an executive assistant who can do the uh, work and can make a photocopy of the document and then go through with a Sharpie and black it out and then recopy it so that it's not possible to, to read what's underneath. Uh, records have to be released when they're ready. They cannot be a reason to, the redactions cannot be a reason to withhold other documents that are part of the same request. So if they request five documents, but only one of them needs to be redacted, you're required to turn over the first four as soon as you have them. Then however long it takes to redact it, you turn it over. If you've got 20 documents that need to be redacted, as each one gets redacted, you're supposed to turn it over, not wait for everything to be done before turning them over. The other thing that I would strongly recommend that you do is that you don't uh, do what uh, DeKalb County did in their uh, audit report where they redacted the entire audit report. Now, um, in and of itself, you think, well, they must have had a good reason to do that. Well, they did. It was a good political reason to do it. They redacted the entirety of a terribly embarrassing report that found that the county had done an absolutely rubbish job of protecting people's informate, private and personal information. And the audit found that it, the way that the county was running security and protections was basically a train wreck. And so they audited, they went through and they uh, blacked out the report and then provided the report to the journalist that requested it, who simply went through, highlighted the black boxes, cut and pasted, and read the entire report and reported on it because they had done a really bad job of redacting. So don't be stupid like the folks down in DeKalb County, A, for violating the law, for redacting something that had no grounds to be redacting, redacted, and then B, doing an absolutely rubbish job of doing it. So what are some of the, uh, dis the disclosures cost? What, what, as an agency, can you uh, ask people to do to pay for uh, getting public records. Well, first of all, understand you don't have to charge. You're not required to do so, you may do that. And uh, records that take you less than 15 minutes time to uh, pull, you're not allowed to charge for. Uh, it's the lowest rate of the qualified person, the first quarter hour is waived. You can charge roughly 10 cents a page, your actual copier costs. These days, I'm not even sure it's 10 cents a page for most uh, copy uh, machines or printing systems. You have to notify the requester if the charges are gonna run more than 25 bucks. And you can ask for pre prepayment if the request is so big, it's gonna cost more than 500 bucks. You cannot charge the time of your attorneys for uh, evaluating whether or not the document you're asking, they're asking for 
should be disclosed. So if you've got to hire an attorney to come in and figure out whether you need to redact some stuff in it, uh, you cannot hit the person who's asking for the records for those attorney fees. That's all on you and, and your agency. So denial. If you're going to deny turning something over, you've got to provide specific legal exceptions under the law, the code section, the subsection, the paragraph, and you got to do it within three business days. No futzing about and waiting until the fourth day to tell them that you're denying something. Um, the law does not require, though, agencies to create records that do not exist. That's totally at your agency's discretion. But if somebody calls you up and say, hey, I'm trying to figure out how many wrecks there have been at Main and Smith Street. Uh, if those records are available in another way, it doesn't allow the fact that they're available in another way to be grounds for you to deny it. So if you could say to them, well, uh, actually we've got a, a database of those things and we can provide you a PDF or we can provide you an Excel spreadsheet with the recs and you'll be able to look up in the Excel spreadsheet where those recs were. Uh, but if it's easy for you to print it out and provide it, it's up to you to do that. And I think it's good service for the agency to do that where they can. Agencies must produce electronic records from the systems that you use. So if you're using QuickBooks to maintain your city county records, and they ask for the QuickBooks file of your county records, you got to turn them over in QuickBooks form. If uh, they can be exported in an Excel spreadsheet or an ASCII delimited file, those are also acceptable. You can't refuse data requests on grounds that exporting or redacting data will require someone to generate a report. In other words, if generating the data based on a date range or filters, that's not grounds for turning it down saying, oh, we don't have to create a record. That's, in fact, you've got a database. You should be able to access that database. Private vendors contracted to maintain government data are subject to the Open Records Act. So if you've got an entity running the water department or traffic tickets, or parking tickets, uh, they are bound by the Open Records Act for providing those records for, what, for the services they're providing to the city. So what happens if you violate the law? Well, any person who knowingly and willfully violates, who knowingly willfully frustrates or attempts to frustrate the access to records is guilty of a misdemeanor and a $1,000 fine, $2,500 fine for additional violations within a year. Um, but it looks really, really bad on your resume if you're a city official who has turned down a request and been convicted of a misdemeanor and you're trying to get a job somewhere. It really would reflect badly uh, in terms of your future employment in city or county government. In addition, uh, there can be civil actions brought. And civil actions, the court can impose a $1,000 fine for the first violation and $2,500 for additional violations. But they can also hit you for the attorney's fees of the person who sends, uh, who files the civil action. And if that's going to be uh, somebody who hires a big silk stocking law firm, those legal fees can mount up pretty fast, as the city of Atlanta learned. We'll get to that in a minute. In a minute. Note that the Act protects disclosures in good faith that are exceptions for the law. So if somebody misses a, a uh, a redaction 
or somebody discloses something that really shouldn't have been disclosed, but they're turned over as part of a records request and there's a mistake made. The act protects disclosure in good faith. There is no criminal penalty for doing that if you turned it over and made a mistake doing it. So let's talk about um, uh, an outcome that didn't go quite so well as perhaps it shouldn't have done. Anybody remember the uh, name of the press secretary for Jenna Garland? Uh, Jenna Garland is her name, press secretary for uh, Mayor Kasim Reed. Uh, she was um, uh, the press secretary when uh, Richard Belcher with Channel 2 made a records request to the Water Department for records relating to uh, unpaid water bills for a whole list of properties. Well, it turns out he was looking into whether the mayor had paid the water bills. And so the uh, records custodian at the water department texted Jenna Garland saying, big effing problem, call me. Can we text? Well, involves Mayor Kasim Reed and Tracy. The mayor just started his speech as following. Uh, got an open records request for a few addresses from WSB. Turns out thousands in unpaid water bills, properties owned by Mayor Kasim Reed and Tracy, his wife. Can you forward the open records request? That happened. Jenna Garland's response. So I would be as unhelpful as possible. Finally, an easy request. Drag this out as long as possible and provide information in the most confusing format possible or available. Well, when the text surfaced uh, in an Open Records Act request, the Attorney General's Office filed criminal charges against uh, uh, Jenna. Uh, the case dragged on for a bit, but she was convicted, fined $1,000. And then early in the year, uh, her appeal was denied last month, uh, denied by the Georgia Court of Appeals. And then there was this jam. This was uh, Jenna Garland's boss, uh, Ann Torres. She moved to block another request from Richard Belcher for Beltline CEO Brian McGovern's contract. And subsequent open record request found the emails threatening the Beltline CEO with text that you're seeing on the screen. You're not obligated to provide anything to Belcher on Friday. The Beltline's only obligated to respond within an estimated timeline of when the contract will be available by Friday. You can determine how long that will be. It can hold until next week or another day that provides a busy news cycle to keep him distracted. Well, when this came out, uh, the Atlanta Journal Constitution and Channel 2 complained to the Attorney General, alleging a culture of political interference with open records requests at City Hall, and civil legal action followed. And since the Open Records Act allows attorney's fees in civil cases where violations were shown, the city ultimately settled for $80,000 paying all of the AJC and WSB's legal fees and promising to do better. Well, uh, how many open records requests are too many? Mayor Khalid, do you want to guess about how many open records requests are too many under the law? I am going to say there is no limit. That is absolutely correct. Um, you do that. You don't normally do that, Tim. Um, I think we have somebody. There is no limit on the number of open records that requests a person can make, as long as the requester pays the reasonable charges for producing the records. So uh, again, no limit on the number of requests, 
as long as they're paying the reasonable charges for producing those records. Uh, and then the, there's one other thing that the law does not allow the number of requests to be grounds to deny records. And taking legal action against a person for making Open Records Act requests would likely violate Georgia's anti-slap statute, which uh, this, it's Georgia's anti-strategic litigation against public participation act. It's designed to prevent lawsuits intended to chill free speech and healthy public debate or intimidate people from speaking out on issues of public concern. And of course, the Federal Civil Rights Act, which uh, says that any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution, the law shall be liable to the party injured in any action of law, suit in equity, or other proceedings. So essentially, um, going after somebody for harassing you with open records requests uh, might well be a major headache for a long, long time. So let me um, turn this over uh, to Alison Viley, and uh, who will pick up with Georgia's open meetings laws. But first, any questions on the open records portion of the program? All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I call you Professor Griff Griffiths. I, I, Richard is great. Um, I, I, I think that there we have a live question as well, um, but let me, let me go see if I can find that question here in the chat. Oh, oh no, we'll, we'll bring them on. I'll, 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 I'll bring them on in a minute. Um, regarding the, the, the requests for records, um, There, there are two. So I, I, I was reading, and I'm actually going to uh, share my screen really quickly. And in addition to, like you know, the the, the open meetings classes that we all have to attend, um, I found a really good article from the Valdosta Times. And they sort of outline things that are allowed and not allowed in um, the uh, the executive editor of the Valdosta Daily Times is one of our board members. Awesome. Um, so my my questions come from just some things I read that were confusing to me there. Uh, so the first one is that, that that human resources, the Georgia Code says right that you can have an executive session for the appointment. Employment. Okay, so that's in the meeting section that's coming up. You want to talk about that? Okay. So um, we're definitely going to talk about that. Let's talk about it. any questions related to open records. Okay, well, this, this one is about some, the second one is about something that you covered. Okay, let's, let's take it on. Uh, you were saying that investigations are investigations that are held in a pending status, right? Police investigations that are held in a pending status. Um, you can't you, you can't get open records for those outside of the original police report and the original request. So if a, if a case is underway, and I'll, I'm going to go into a lot more detail in the police portion of this, which comes up after Allison's on the meeting records, but uh, essentially the original police request uh, the original police report and any supplementals to it are considered open records. So the sheriff's in, initial incident report, uh, 911 calls are considered open records uh, and, and dispatch records. But the investigative file itself is not uh, open while a case is still being investigated. Once the case is closed, that becomes a public record. A lot of crime dramas on TV rely on that. They want to be able to go back and look at a closed case and they'll uh, do an open records request on a closed case and then do a big follow-up story and, and do it. It's a staple of, of some of those. But 
uh, family members, they can also go back and, and look at, at those things. My, my question is how long, um, or is there any recourse if you feel like an investigation is being held open to deny you access to the records? Um, that's a tricky one. And that's a big tension point between um, public, the public and uh, police investigations. The AG's office might well weigh in on something like that. If it's been two years, nothing no there's been no arrest and no there's nobody actively working the case you could make a really good argument that that case is effectively closed and should be uh, uh should be open so uh we can um we can certainly uh, get into more of that in, in just a little bit in my follow-up question um um is uh, it's in the same sort of gray area and that is you talked about a a reasonable price what is the what is defined as reasonable 10 cents a page and the lowest cost for somebody's time for pulling all the records so um the lowest qualified person so if it's somebody going to the file cabinet and put, pull it out or going over to the warehouse to pull it out and bring it over you know, if, if it's somebody who's driving the pickup truck, getting file box A, and it cut, you know, he's being paid 15 bucks and takes him an hour, you can charge that. Uh, uh, you can charge for 45 minutes of that hour at 15 bucks if, if that's what his pay is. So the, the 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 law is a little bit more explicit around reasonableness than it is around whether something is open or closed. Correct. All right, so I, I, we have um, on the line, Mr. Richard Snellings, who is one of the people who uh, brought this all together. Uh, Mr. Snellings, you have a question? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, in terms of reasonableness for charges, um, I requested some credit card statements and was charged over $2,000 for those credit card statements. Um, is, is that a, Would that be considered a reasonable charge? If it depends are... on how much work was involved in pulling them together. On the face of it, that sounds rather a lot. But if you know they're pulling it from a file cabinet, um, or they had to uh, go through it and research it, if they're charging you the attorney's fees of going through to redact that data, um, to pull out personal information, perhaps, that's maybe a big problem because they shouldn't be charging you the attorney's fees for the redaction. So yeah, uh, how many pages, how many pages? Uh, I'm not sure how many pages it was, but it was about nine months of credit card statements. So nine months of credit card statements that were, that for were the held entire election. city? No, for the, just for the city council. So I, I, I don't want to be caught out uh, in get, being a, um, a, a referee in your dispute. But if okay. you, but I, what I will tell you is that there are specific reasonable standards. And if you have questions, uh, the AG's office can answer that and you should touch base with the AG's office. Uh, particularly if you've got a, a pattern of that occurring. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Snellings. Um, I, I I do have one comment from from Lady Dana Austin, and I want to let people know that our chat box is open. Unlike our council meetings, the chat box is open. So if you have questions, you can type them in the YouTube. Chat. Uh, you can also send them in at ColleenCarriage.com, but it's a little easier if you want to get them answered right now to type them in the chat. Uh, she states the federal code of federal regulations outlines well the process and rationale for redaction, particularly as it pertains to personal data. So does the I, that's a federal code, which which probably trumps state or city codes or is it a thing where the federal sets the minimum and the 
and a local jurisdiction can have a, a higher level of redaction. What is the what is the case law, if any, around what can I've been focusing entire almost entirely on Georgia open records, and these are the re redaction requirements under Georgia open records, right? So uh, income tax records are considered private at the federal level, and likewise, the state follows those same rules. Um, social security numbers are generally considered private. Um, I am not an expert on federal uh, open records law, but I'm sure Claire uh, is and can speak to that when we get to that portion. Or perhaps Allison knows a little bit more about that. Um, but in terms of federal versus state law, um, the the um, the privacy records uh, at the state level are set up very specifically in favor of transparency and openness and minimizing the number of redactions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, let's move on to Allison. Allison, can you share your screen? Yes, I will share my screen. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, Open Meetings Act under Georgia law. Um, Georgia law is fairly broad and has uh, very few exceptions. And that's because the goal of these laws is to promote government transparency and public confidence in government bodies. Um, and this photo is from the 2019 Atlanta Task Force for Promotion of the Public Trust. Uh, which was put together with the goal of increasing transparency and accountability in Georgia. Um, so some examples of agencies and government bodies that are subject to the Open Meetings Act include um, city councils, uh, school districts, state legislatures, and local board of commissioners. So all of those meetings would be covered by the Open Meetings Act. Um, so what meetings are open to the public? It depends who is there and what the meeting is about. So the rule is that whenever a quorum meets for official business, the meeting must be open to the public. Uh, what does a quorum mean? A quorum is the minimum number of members that must be present to make the proceedings legally valid. So that would be 50% of the members plus one of a governing body would make a quorum. Um, and one thing that's important is that the quorum does not have to meet in person. So meetings that are via phone, uh, via Zoom, or even via group text um, might be open meetings under the Open Meetings Act. Um, and secondly, to be considered a meeting, the meeting, uh, the members must be formulating, presenting, discussing, or voting on official policy, um, business, or a public matter of the agency. Um, so this rule would not apply when um, bodies are meeting to inspect physical property, to attend relevant seminars or training courses, um, to meet with legislative or executive branches of the state or federal government, to travel to other meetings, or when the meeting is for uh, ceremonial, civic, or religious re um, reasons. But for any of those meetings, if official business is taking place, um, that wouldn't apply. The Open Meetings Act would apply to those types of meetings if official business is taking place. So now that we've talked a little bit about what meetings must be open to the public, we're going to talk about what it means to be open to the public. Um, so first, the public must have full access to the meetings and may make video and audio recordings of the meetings. So access um, must be contemporaneous. You have to be able to see what's going on in real time. Um, access can be in person or remote. Um, it could be via live streaming, but it must be uh, in real time. It is not sufficient to just make a recording of the meeting available after it's happened. Um, and a note about public comment. Public comment is not generally required under the Open Meetings Act. The agency can decide whether to allow time at the meeting or public comment, but one thing to note is that 
school boards are required to have a period of public comment at their meetings under a different Georgia law. So another thing that is required is that the agency must provide notice to the public before all meetings, even emergency ones. The notice must have the date, time, and place of the meetings. Um, and for regularly scheduled meetings, notice should go out at least a week before. And the notice must be posted at the regular meeting location, physically must be posted. And then also it must be posted on the agency website. Um, for non-regularly scheduled meetings, uh, written or oral notice should be given at least 24 hours in advance. Emergency meetings are allowed with less than 24 hours notice, but the agency should provide um, notice within a reasonable time frame given the circumstances. Uh, and the notice generally should be distributed um, with the newspaper with the largest circulation in the county. Uh, before all meetings, the agency should make an agenda of the matters to be considered available. And that's because the public has the right to know what will be discussed at the meeting ahead of time, so they can make an informed decision about whether they want to attend the meeting. Um, the agency should be available upon request, and it should be posted at the meeting site as well. Uh, which It should be posted uh, as reasonable and in advance as possible, which generally means uh, sometime within the two weeks before the meeting is when the agenda needs to be posted. And finally, the public has the right to know what happened at the meeting after it's occurred, even if they are, if, even if they um, didn't attend. And so the minutes must be posted, uh, they must be kept in writing, and they must be made available to the public. Uh, the timeline on that is no later than immediately following the next regular meeting. In addition to the minutes, um, two days after the, within two days after the meeting, a summary of the matters acted on and which members were present must be made available. Um, so that's within two days. Um, during COVID, we've had some electronic meetings, obviously, um, but there is no exception for, the, for electronic meetings under the Open Meetings Act. Uh, if a public meeting is on Zoom, the public has to be able to see the whole thing and hear it clearly. Uh, and that's really important. The Attorney General's Office recently went after a city council for making meetings incomprehensible. They had put a mic next to a speaker that made sound quality very overmodulated so that you couldn't uh, see anything and you couldn't hear anything. And that's a violation of the Open Meetings Act. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about executive sessions. Uh, executive sessions are known as sort of the limited exception to the Open Meetings Act. Um, an agency is allowed to close a meeting if a specific statutory exception applies uh, and if a majority vote is taken in a properly noticed and open meeting to close that meeting. Uh, if the agency does vote to close a meeting, um, some uh, a procedure must be followed when the minutes get filed, uh, an affidavit needs to get filed with the minutes. Uh, depending on the agency rules, the affidavit should be signed by either the person presiding over the meeting or by each member in attendance. Uh, the affidavit must state under oath that the subject matter of the meeting was devoted to the matters that were within the exceptions provided by law and identifying that specific relevant exception. Um, some of the most commonly used exceptions uh, are personnel matters, attorney-client discussions of litigation, and real estate matters. And this is really important. Votes must be taken in public. Um, so even if an executive, even if uh, an executive session is had, the votes must any votes must be taken in public, and the public must be able to understand what's being voted on. Uh, so you need to explain what's being voted on. You can't just say. Uh, item two without explaining what's being voted on. Uh, and finally, some penalties for non-compliance. All actions taken during a meeting that are closed in violation of the Open Meetings Act are voidable. They can be set aside by a court if they are challenged within 90 days. Um, officials who participate in closed meetings can be subject to recall. Uh, and failure to give adequate notice can also result in the invalidation of the proceedings. Uh, and then the uh, same civil and criminal penalties that um, Richard talked about earlier are also apply in the Open Meetings Act context. 
Um, so with that, I will open it to questions on the Open Meetings Act. If anyone has any questions on the Open Meetings Act, uh, Claire, Richard, and I can field them at this point. Stop my share. Hi, awesome. I am uh, going to start here with the with the chat. Um, how you talked about the, the 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 need for meetings to be published uh, and the agenda of the meetings to be. Does the agenda of the meetings have to be published or just the actual notice that the meeting is happening? Let me start there. The notice must be published. Um, the agenda just needs to be available to the public. Okay. And and after the agenda is made available, are there any rules on how much it can be changed, what things can be removed, what things can be added? So the agenda does not prevent something from being considered at the meeting. Um, it did, yeah, it doesn't prevent something from being considered legitimately at the meeting as long as it's sort of legitimately raised. Um, might run into an issue if the agenda was not like sort of deliberately leaving something off, but um, it doesn't prevent anything from being considered. It's not necessarily going to be the law of the land when you have an agenda. Right. What uh, What about the converse? What if there, there are 12 items on the agenda and then 11 of them are removed? Uh, sorry, what are removed? Yes. Um, I, I don't think the Open Meetings Act would prevent um, anything from being removed from the agenda. Um, it's just sort of a initial guidepost. As long as it's sort of being talked about in open and you're saying what you're removing from the agenda, I don't think there'd be an issue. All right. That is there's also the 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 rules of the individual board or entity that would uh, come into play. Because if you have bylaws that are set up for your council that say uh, all items must be discussed in open uh, session twice before being voted on, uh, uh, that uh, would vary from an, an entity to entity and you have to follow your own rules that you have in place and as Allison correctly pointed out uh, you, you can all always vote to change the agenda but the agenda is the document that you bring in that your public understands is going to be discussed at the meeting and uh, any changes to that agenda uh, presumably would take place as part of a routine process of the council making a decision to change that agenda. So that 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 process uh, in and of itself brings transparency because you know the mayor and three other folks decide, well, it's not the right moment to discuss this. We're not ready to make that decision. We're going to postpone that to next week. We're going to vote to postpone that. Does that make sense? Oh, definitely. Um, and then is this the, I don't want to jump ahead. Is this the executive session? Uh, people have questions about that. Is this that section or do you want to do more presenting before? No, you can plow in with executive session. Claire, Allison, and I will do the best to swat them away. More Allison and Claire than me, though. Okay, perfect. I have uh, the three questions. So we know that um, we know that executive session is is limited to matters of real estate, personnel, and litigation. I think litigation is. So no, it's not limited to that. There are several more executive sessions. Those are just some examples of the commonly used one. I just want to flag that. All right. Will Will you Will you Tell because those are those are the three that I'm aware of. Those are the three um, in our council. What are other things that can be discussed in executive session? So all of the um, the relevant statute is uh, section fifty fourteen three of um, the Open Meetings Act. Um, if you want to check out the list, is there? Um, there's 
most of them are related to real estate and litigation. Um, let me just take a look here. That, 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 that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll talk just about those about those three now. Um, and I will put that in the I will put that section of legal code in the YouTube chat now for people who want to look it up. Um, well, if I can because it's, it's very long. Um, the first the first question, though, is about real estate. So, and, and, and correct me again if if I'm wrong, right? The but the the real estate exemption um, applies to a specific real estate transaction and not necessarily a, a public policy discussion. So, if we are if we are if we are talking about purchasing, I'm, I'm going to use some. I'm going to just use something crazy that we're that we're totally not doing. So anybody listening, no, we are not thinking about doing this right now, right? But let's say at some point the city is thinking about um, creating a football team, and we're going to buy a football stadium. If we have an actual deal on the table for a particular parcel of land for a football stadium. That is an executive session matter. But if we are just saying, hey, we would like to buy a football, we would like to we would like to build a football stadium and we want to debate about what area of town to put it in. That is not something that could be executive session privileged. Correct. Uh, that would be my interpretation. Another way of looking at it would be uh, we're having a public policy discussion about whether more parkland is required. Uh, the ratio of parkland around the city uh, varies by district. And we, as a matter of policy, want to try to put more parkland in areas of the city where there are fewer parks. So that will be an open public discussion. Then you get to buy lot five uh, through seven um, and turn those lots into a public park. That discussion would go on behind closed doors, but the vote to buy that property would have to be in public. Got you. Um, and then, you know, real estate transactions, anybody who's ever bought a home knows that like they, 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 there could be months, right? There can be offers and counter offers. And at what point, you know, I, I've read that final real estate decisions must be voted in public. What constitutes a final real estate decision? If we if we make an offer on the property, do we have to come out and vote that we've made an offer or or does it? Or do we not have to say anything publicly until we are entering into a contract? I will defer to Claire on that one. So I think if you are, I have to, if you have to have a vote to authorize action by the city, that vote has to be made in public. Um, so you would have to talk amongst yourselves in the executive session, decide yes, we want to purchase this plot of land, um, or maybe we don't. Um, but you know, if you are taking a vote, that vote needs to be an open session, and people need to be able to understand what you're voting on. So you can't just say, "We're going to vote on that thing we talked about back there in the back room." <laughs> um, you have to, you know, give enough information to let the the public know what's being decided. What if? What if? What if? the motion was um i move to make an offer of x amount of dollars for the real estate purchase we discussed in executive session so i don't think you have to give the details of the offer that you're going to make um because part of the reason that executive session extends to discussion of real estate purchases is that if somebody knows the city is going to have interest in a piece of property, you know, that can affect the value of the land and maybe it, you know, encourages people to make counter offers or what have you. So um, I don't think you have to 
you know, disclose the details of this proposed contract that you would be offering to the to the seller. Um, but you do need to let people know the issue that's being voted on. And so, then once it's a final contract, you have to disclose the actual contract. So so you don't have to say the dollar amount or the address, but you do have to say it's a stadium or it's a park or what is it that what is it? Because that's not clear. What is it? You said it has to be explicit enough for people to understand, but what does that really mean? So I think the address or location is um, important, but you don't have to say what what the amount would be. Okay. Do you would have be my would be my interpretation based on what we understand the purpose is for allowing real estate deals to be discussed in private. You have to say what the purpose of the purchase is for. I have to say what, yeah, what the purpose is and where where it is, and that they're voting to to purchase it. And, right. and, and really stressing this point that I made very much at the beginning, while these are two brilliant lawyers here and one retired journalist, we're not giving legal advice. So on a specific thing, if you were, in fact, to buy that big stadium, you probably are going to want to have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with your county or city attorney about the proper procedure for managing that in an open and transparent way. And also know you can be more transparent than the law requires. You don't, you, you can make a policy decision to say, we're gonna do all of this in the open. We're going to uh, lay it all out there. We're going to build a stadium. This is the bid that we've put into the stadium authority. If they take it, they take it. If they don't, we'll move on and we'll build a pocket park instead. Does that make sense? Yes, the law sets the minimum, but we can, the, the minimum required to reveal. Yes, yes. Um, so I, I want to switch to to human resources. Uh, this is, this is the, the, the section of the code that I was reading before, where it says executive session allows for the appointment, employment, compensation, hiring, disciplinary action, dismissal, or periodic evaluation or rating of a public officer, right? Or people interviewing for a job. So that seems to cover pretty much everything. So what? it's important to note that the law is saying you can discuss those things in private. You can't take a vote that's binding on those issues in private. The vote still has to be in public, but you can have a discussion um, that's not watched, you know, by the public. Um, also, if you're taking evidence, so for instance, if you have people who are giving testimony, say about a disciplinary matter and you have witnesses or participants who are you know giving information that's going to inform the council's decision that has to be in open session as well it's just the internal deliberations that can occur in the executive session okay um about this about this issue You know, you can't you you can't take a vote, right? The vote has to be public. Can you take a poll? Can you take consensus uh, about something in executive session? And then, if you do, does that consensus have to? Does that automatically have to become a vote? I I think uh, consensus can be part of a discussion. Are we in general agreement here? And if you see a bunch of nods, okay, well, then let's take it outside. Before the city is committed to anything, you've got to vote on it in public in front of everybody, and they have to understand what you're voting on. Is there, is there ever a time where consensus in executive session is sufficient enough to take action without a public vote? 
My understanding of the law is no. I'm reading this is the vote on any matter covered by this paragraph shall be taken in public and minutes of the meeting as provided in this chapter shall be made available. Okay. Um, all right. It looks like we have uh, another question from uh, Mr. Ron Booth. Mr. Booth. Yes, thank, thank you, Mayor, and, and, and thank you, everyone, for uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, this question pertains to executive session also. Uh, the question is, does executive session apply to individuals who are no longer elected officials? In other words, can they share information that they learned about in executive session while they were in office and are now no longer in office? Can they share that information? Yes, they can. There is no um, rule that says people who participate in executive session are bound to silence. So um, it's up to the individual members who were in the session what they say about what went on. Wait, I'm sorry. I want to. I want to ask a follow up, a clarifying question. They are no longer bound after they're out of office, even about something that is executive session privilege? I just, I, that, that, that seems, I just wanna make clear what you're saying. Yes, and it's not the fact that they're out of office, even if you're still in office, there's no um, vow of secrecy um, about what goes on in executive session. The purpose of it is to give the chance for the, the body, the council, to have discussions that are candid and open because they're not occurring in the public eye. But there's there's no rule that says once you leave executive session, you can't share with anyone what was said. Now, if you share attorney-client privilege communication, you're waiving your attorney-client privilege, which you wouldn't wanna do. Um, but that's true anytime you have a meeting with an attorney that's privileged. If you talk about it with someone else, you've waived the privilege. That's not unique to an executive session. So. Um, there's reasons why you might choose not to say what happened in executive session, but there's no law that prohibits it. So the, uh, I'm sorry, this, this, this runs counter, and thank you so much, Mr. Booth, for this question. This runs counter to what I thought I heard at Georgia Municipal Association training. So I'm going to say thought I heard, because I'm not, you know, there's no transcript. But... I always hear about how, oh, you know, pay attention to this, to this, to this class, to this section, because this is going to keep you out of jail, right? Like we always hear about, we always hear these these stories about people going to jail for violating executive session. I don't, I don't know if they're just, I don't know if someone is act that's actually happened to someone, or if it's just like. The, the fantasy of, of of the man who actually leaves his wife for his mistress that you know everybody has that story but but are you are you saying and I, I I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep using this stadium example if we were talking about purchasing a stadium in executive session you're saying that I can come out after executive session and say hey we were talking about purchasing a stadium Sure, there's nothing in the law that, in the Open Meetings Act law or the executive session law that prohibits you saying that. So what- You might, you might really piss off your fellow council members who were expecting their conversations and that you have to evaluate your relationship with them. And also you might blow the deal by coming out and disclosing that, that detail. So, uh, the reason for the executive session, as, as Claire said, is to have a frank exchange of, of details, consult with your attorney about how much legal red tape is involved in this stadium deal and what steps need to be taken now and six months from now and what do we need to, what laws or or measures do we need to vote on in what order in order to make this deal go through? Um, and as Claire says, if you blow that uh, relationship with your attorney and uh, your attorney-client privilege, 
that's going to be a big problem for you if there's litigation after the deal doesn't go through. So uh, there are a lot of factors that push uh, both ways. Sometimes it's really helpful to tell the public, yes, we did have an executive session. Yes, we're talking about trying to figure out how to build a stadium. No, I'm not going to get into specifics. Right? All of that would be perfectly fine and protect the interests of the public's right to know, but also your need to be able to consummate a deal that actually will go through. That's, I, I, is there is there anything that is prohibited from being shared that was discussed in executive session? Not uh, under the Open Meetings Act. Okay. There may be other there may be other uh, aspects of the law that your attorney might uh, advise you on. This this is mind blowing. I've heard of I you know in my five years in elected office. This is the most liberal, and I don't know if this is because this is the First Amendment Foundation, but this is the most liberal reading that I've heard. I've heard everything in trainings from nothing that is talked about in executive session can be discussed under penalty of law. I've heard something in the middle that is like, you can talk about the topic and you can say what you said, but you can't say what anybody else said. And now I'm hearing something that that seems just a little bit more uh, beyond than that. Uh, I, I that's I, I this is this is this is a courageous conversation. This is very um, well. We we're happy to poke around and do more research into whether there might be other statutes that come into play that we're not aware of. Remember, our training is about the Open Records Act, the Open Meetings Act, uh, the law enforcement provisions and social media. So it's not necessarily going to cover every detail uh, of what you're doing in government. And your county or city attorney may give you some advice that from a practical standpoint meets the requirements of the law, but may be different from what we're suggesting. And, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to make a statement and you all can respond to it and then, and then we can move on. But what, but one of the reasons that I is, one of the reasons that I wanted to put this item on the agenda for a public meeting is because I thought that the council and the citizens needed to be educated about this issue and that we might have been using a broad brush. I have felt, let, let me say, we meet twice a month. Our city council meets twice a month. And for the past five years, at every we have executive session. The shortest executive session has been about 30 minutes. Our executive sessions last on average about an hour and a half. We had a, we had a count, we had a, we had a work session. We had a meeting this week that was about seven hours, four hours of it is a public meeting and three hours of the meeting is an executive session. I've always been concerned that we take items back to executive session using this sort of broad interpretation so that, again, I'm going to just use this stadium example, right? That like once the word stadium is said in executive session, no conversation of any kind about a stadium can ever be said publicly without violating executive session. And, and, and you know, like we've, We've had instances where people have wanted to talk about things and it's like, oh, you, you're skirting the line of executive session. And so it just feels like a, it feels like a, 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 a tactic, a place that we take conversations that we don't want to have publicly. So this, this information that you're giving me is, is I, I really have to sit with that. 
So I do want to note that, for instance, if you are in litigation and you're settling a matter and maybe one of the settlement provisions um, is that you can't, it's a non-disclosure provision where you can't discuss the terms of the settlement, you know, that's a contract that's binding on the parties to that contract. And so there might be penalties associated with going out and talking to the public about the terms of the settlement that you're not supposed to share. But what makes that um, unlawful or gives it consequences is not the Open Meetings Act. It's the separate contract of the settlement agreement itself. And there may be all kinds of situations like that where you you have a contract that you're agreeing to abide by that says you can't talk about certain things. Um, but that is not the Open Meetings Act. That is whatever the contract is that's being entered into by the council. All right. So I'm, I'm going to ask this. I, I, I lied. This is my final, final question. When, when, whether it's myself as a member of council or just a citizen has concerns like what are y'all back there talking about what is what is the recourse do they do they call the first amendment foundation hotline and a team of lawyers come out and like like what what is what does a, a regular citizen do when they feel like we're just doing too much in executive session well you have to disclose um there has to be an affidavit filed following each executive session so uh that's notarized detailing the exceptions under the law. So uh, if you've not been doing that in those executive sessions, that's a, a, a big problem for you guys uh, downstream. Um, I, I think it is always better public policy to have uh, verbal debates in public where everybody gets to see what's being said and everybody's position on those matters. It informs the public. It also informs the person who's making a point when half the room boos, right? Uh, you, you get f instant feedback on, on whether or not your proposal is a good one or uh, as a public official. And so having that public debate is so important for the democratic process. And it's got to be civil. It's got to be, you know, for it, for it to be work. But you seem, uh, in this discussion, you, you know, you've not been pounding the desk. You you seem like the kind of person who would um, tolerate somebody who disagreed with you, right? So that the city council as a whole has to operate in that manner in order for it to work effectively. And that you have to reserve the executive session times for those times when you need to make a call on those things that Claire is talking about, a contract, a personnel matter, a, a land purchase, where it's not a policy matter, but a specific item relating to a specific deal contract proposal. Does that make sense? Yes. Um... And if I could just add in, um, you do have to keep minutes of what occurs during executive sessions. That's in the executive sessions. It's either in the executive sessions section of the statute or the open meeting section of the statute. You just don't have to make those publicly available, but you have to keep the meetings of what happens in executive session so that the, if there is a challenge, you know, if some if a citizen says, you know, you went into executive session to say you were going to talk about one thing that's allowed and you actually spent the whole time talking about something else that should have happened in the open. You know, if if a lawsuit is brought saying you violated the Open Meetings Act by doing that, the court may need to look at those minutes from the executive session. Um, and so you have to keep them and and maintain them. You just don't have to make them publicly available. Uh, thank you for that. I will I, I will say um, two things about that. There have been times where I have excused myself from executive session because I felt like we were violating it. There have been times where I have not gone into executive session for fear that we were violating it. And then lastly, 
Um, we are, and, and this this is not necessarily for you for your response, but I, but the, the chat is lighting up about this issue. Um, there have one of the things that I've asked. You talked about this affidavit. So right now, um, I think myself and the clerk may be the only people that that have to sign our affidavit. But a best practice recommendation that we actually got from the Georgia Municipal Association and that I have um, tried to put into practice is requiring the signatures of everyone that is in the executive session, right? So it won't just be myself as the mayor or the clerk on the hook, but everybody that's there is saying, we did not violate the, you know, the executive session. And the second thing that I will say is, um, you will always hear me ask our city attorney and our previous mayor did the same. Um, you will always hear me ask our city attorney, was there anything discussed in executive session for which we need to now make a public vote? And nine times out of 10, the answer is no. Uh, so, so, so there is both. I just want the public to know that there, there are two records uh, that that can be examined. Well, there, there are three records, right? One are the minutes of the executive session if it goes to court. There is the affidavit. You can see um, if people signed or didn't sign it, and then you also have this public record in the meeting at the end of every exec executive session where we're asking the attorney, is there something that we should vote on publicly? And there's actually another record. So to go into executive session, you have to be in you have to be in an open meeting. Somebody has to make a motion to go into executive session. It has to be seconded, and then people have to vote. And I, it's either majority or or super majority that have to approve it. So that vote to go into an executive session should be captured in the minutes of the open session. And who voted for it and who voted against? have to be captured in the minutes of the open session. So if you voted against it because you thought it was not proper, there's a record of that in the minutes or there, the law says there has to be. Um, so that's another place where you can see sort of, you know, who wanted to do this and who didn't. Got it. I, as a mayor, I don't get a vote. So yeah. You, oh, okay. But, You're a tiebreaker. Is that how it works? <laughs> yes, I don't get a vote. Yeah. All right. Last section. Thank you so much for this. This is so helpful for so many of us, myself included. Well, then uh, let's move on to law enforcement specifics. And then uh, you'll definitely want to stick around for Claire's session on uh, uh, social media, particularly since your city is heavily engaged in social media stuff. Um, OK, uh, some law enforcement specifics that uh, I think you'll find interesting. Um, law enforcement records generated during an active investigation, uh, while the investigation is open, those are uh, exempt from disclosure. They don't have to turn them over to you. So interviews, contacts with the confidential sources, the notes from the investigator that are in the file, all of those things are uh, protected from disclosure while that investigation is open and ongoing. But initial incident reports, supplemental narratives to those initial reports, or documents that existed before an investigation are subject to disclosure. So let's say you're uh, doing an, there's a police investigation of uh, the uh, stand that sells hot dogs in the park. And the uh, records of the accounts for the stand that sells hot dogs at the park has existed um, over the last two years, but it's now also being looked at as part of the investigation into corruption at the hot dog stand. Uh, those records are subject to disclosure. Those business records are subject to disclosure because they existed before the investigation started. So if a reporter from the South Fulton Gazette wants to come in and look at their records for the hot dog stand, they're allowed to do so, even though 
there's an investigation of the hot dog stand underway. Records in closed investigation are public, and that includes crime, crime lab reports and photographs from the crime lab. It means any departmental policies and procedures are public. Uh, in Georgia, felony convictions are public. In those initial incident and arrest reports, internal affairs reports, they have to be turned over 10 days after the investigation is submitted to the agency for action. So there's a little bit of a head start allowed by the agency. Okay, we've done an internal affairs investigation. We've submitted it for action. The reporters and the public have to wait 10 days after the investigation is submitted before they can get their hands on it. All 911 materials, computer aided dispatch records are open and transparent. Any certificates of training, firearms training, anything else that's a certificate of training for a law officer are open and public. Applications for employment, that allows the public to see whether Officer Jones, who worked in the Lizard Lick uh, Police Department but was fired for uh, malfeasance, and then went to the Lickspittal Police Department and then was fired again. It allows them to track uh, rogue employees. Uh, so applications for employment are open for public inspection. There are a whole slew of mandatory exemptions. Uh, I'll let you take these in. I won't read them all off. I will hit some of the high points. Um, confidential informants, obviously. Uh, autopsy photos are not subject uh, to disclosure except to the family. If the family wants to see them, they may. And if the family wants to disclose them, they may. Uh, grand jury testimony when sealed is not subject uh, to disclosure. Insurance investigations into fires are not subject to disclosure if the police department gets their hands on those or is using them as part of their case building. Of course, when they go to court, they become part of the record. Uh, names, IDs of rape victims, unless the rape victim wants to disclose it. Again, like other stuff, personal tax, social security numbers. Tag infos are not uh, subject to disclosure, except that if you Call up the DOT, they'll provide you tag information. Whistleblower identities, wiretap informa information, and juvenile records for most crimes, and child abuse reports, unless there's a court order disclosing them, uh, are not, they're exempt, I should say, from open records requests. There's some special rules applying to accident reports. They require the written receipt of a statement of need. So I was in a wreck uh, with uh, America Lead and I want the accident report. I go to the police department. I say, hey, uh, America Lead, uh, I hit him and I need the accident report so I can file an insurance claim. And Merkel is going to get it, make sure that his insurance uh, company knows that I didn't, uh, that he didn't cause the wreck. Uh, for news organizations, they can say, hey, I need a written statement of need because I'm going to report on it. Here, uh, here's my written statement of need. We want to report on this is massive wreck, or this is the third wreck that Merkel has got into. And so we want to report on those. Uh, Booking records and mugshot photos require an affirmation in writing that the photographs won't be placed on a website somewhere that uh, charges for uh, removal or deletion of photographs. My poor son was on a camping trip and his college roommate decided to throw a big party and he learns about the big party and that it's a little out of control by phone and so he drives home just as the police arrive and they ask who, who's the, who, whose place is this? It's mine, you're under arrest for uh, disturbing the peace, right? 
and for uh, 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 having a, a party that had minors drinking. Well, once it was clear that uh, he had nothing to do with any of this, the charges were dropped, but his mugshot was out there on these websites that were charging $500 to pull the picture down. And ultimately, uh, it took uh, quite a bit of uh, legal threats from a lawyer to get them taken down, but the law was changed to avoid circumstances like that, and the booking photos are no longer provided unless that affirmation is provided. Uh, autopsy or coroner reports. It requires a family member to provide proof of kinship for the images or videos uh, depicting a person who's been dismembered or mutilated in some way. And then family violence incident reports are only disclosed if an arrest is made. So unlike all other incident reports, you know, a drug bust, a car wreck, uh, a, uh, a fire, a, um, an arrest for drug, any, any, all kinds of things, a family violence incident report is only provided if an arrest is made. So uh, initial incident reports. The initial incident reports have to be released upon request, regardless of whether they're part of an active investigation. That includes the initial report, any supplemental reports, any narrative reports. I came on the scene and I saw Mr. Griffiths and uh, he was trying to pretend he hadn't hit Merrick Khalid's car. Uh, whatever is laid out in that incident report. Any similar documents attached to the initial report. Um, you can redact personal information. You could redact Mayor Khalid's home address, home telephone number. Uh, the fact that he had his kids in the car, you could take out the identification of his dependents or immediate family members. But you cannot maintain separate internal and public versions of the initial incident report. This became a big issue in North Georgia where uh, the incident reports became as brief as a deputy was called to Smith Street in Hiawassee or whatever other name of the town it was. And what was left out was there he saw 500 marijuana plants and uh, the uh, renter of the house, unbeknownst to the owner, had been planting marijuana plants and the owner's insurance inspector blew the whistle and called the owner who called us. So all of that stuff, which was in the incident report, was being redacted. And that the attorney general's office took a very dim view of. There's nothing in the Open Records Act the assistant attorney general wrote in a very grumpy letter that allows an agency to maintain two different versions of a public record and to withhold the internal copy when no statutory provision exempts the record from release. So basically, she said, you can't do that. Um, and uh, that practice has now stopped in that county in North Georgia. So records in any pending investigation or prosecution of criminal activity are not required to be released, but when the file is closed or the investigation is concluded, they, they have to be turned over on request. And this includes cases that are unsolved, but otherwise closed. So, so there's no action being taken on the case. They have to turn it over. Again, initial police report, arrest reports and initial incident reports always, always public. So body cam videos, dash cam videos, body cam recorders uh, in closed cases must be released. The Georgia courts have not determined whether the footage in open cases are open records, but both previous GBI directors, Vernon Keenan and Vic Reynolds supported the release of police videos saying, it's often beneficial to the officers, clears up misinformation, diffuses community tension. So they fully support it being released 
as soon as practical. Because if, again, if it's a big controversial case, it lowers the tension in the community when everything's out there and everything everybody can see everything laid out. And often it's beneficial to the officers. The new uh, uh, a, a GBI director, we don't know his position on it yet, but he came from Cobb County where Vic Reynolds came from and they in Cobb County have an outstanding record of releasing uh, police records. So news media access, this is a, uh, a big deal um, where you have in the small community and then the reporters show up when there's a big story. They, the, the government can't take away photographs from news media or prohibit the taking of photographs in public places. They can't limit interviews with potential witnesses who are willing to talk to the reporters. They can't review, seize, or destroy the work that reporters have done or videos of law enforcement without a warrant for those videos or photographs. And then they can't destroy them. They, can't, they can ask for them, but they have to have a warrant. And the news media have the right to conduct news gathering activities on property that's open to the public. So you can't do what they did down in Macon just recently, which was send a bunch of reporters to the other side of the highway, on the other side of the four lane, on the other side of the railroad tracks, when the public was driving by and where the public was able to walk by the site of a uh, police investigation. So again, everything we've talked about in these last three little sessions here uh, on open records, open meetings, and police law enforcement records are all found in these open government guides, which are available for purchase from the First Amendment Foundation for a modest amount or you can download them in PDF form for free by going to the gfaf.org uh, website and you can just get them, download them. They're up to date uh, and uh, they're outstanding guides for working through these processes. So now let's move on to online speech unless there are questions on the law enforcement section. Mayor Khalid, do you have questions related to the law enforcement section? Hearing, hearing no questions at this point, um, uh, I've got, we're, uh, well, we've just unfortunately lost Claire because she had a hard stop at seven. Uh, right, so. Um, One quick question is, uh, is, is this the standard, because we're talking about Georgia laws, is this the standard across all municipalities? Um, or yes, this all municipalities, all, uh, cities and counties, all government agencies of state government, all uh, with the exception of the legislature, which exempted itself from the Open Records Act. Uh, some, some irony there, uh, says the guy from the First Amendment Foundation. Uh, but yes, any creatures of, of government, boards, commissions, uh, there's a whole separate set of rules for the courts in Georgia and the court rules. That's a whole other hour that we could take you through, uh, which we're not going to get into tonight. Uh, but you can get the complete background on open courts in Georgia by going to the GFAP website. And I'll put those I'll share the screen again with where you can go for those booklets and those proceedings there. So you can uh, you can get that. So uh, that's where you can go to get those open government guides. You can download them for free or you can email info at gfap.org and for a modest amount, you can pay to have them mailed to you. Okay, I think everybody should be able to get that at that point. Okay, I'm sorry that we lost Claire. She's got a fantastic presentation on um, the uh, 
and well, social media and social media responsibilities and the First Amendment. Uh, but I, she will be a great person to invite back for a subsequent uh, discussion. Thank you. I, I tell you what, well, I think that this was super informative. Um, I will work on having a part two where we'll just do the social media presentation. She'll and, love that. And then if people have questions about this presentation, I'm going to make sure that this video is available both um, on my website and in my newsletter. I will tell people now, if you are not receiving the newsletter, uh, you can text the word Fulton. I'm putting this in the chat as well. You can text the word Fulton to 33777. Um, and of course, you can follow me on all the social medias at uh, uh, Khalid Cares USA. You probably won't be able to see this whole video on TikTok or, in, you know, they have a they have a, uh, a 90 second. No, I think they're up to three minutes now, but we're, we're a little bit longer than three minutes. Um, um. There's a fantastic uh, set of frequently asked questions on the GFAF and the UGA First Amendment Clinic website. Um, the UGA First Amendment Clinic uh, open government FAQs. You go to bit.ly. Uh, let's see if, well, I think. Uh, in the chat. You're seeing that in the chat. You can repost that to everybody. Uh, maybe you can add that up. But it's a terrific resource, um, and uh, it will be well worth uh, somebody who had questions going to check out those FAQs. Okay, perfect. All right, I want to thank you all so much. Uh, the rest of you don't go anywhere. We got a few minutes. Uh, we, we we've got a lot of events happening. We have a whole Southside weekend. Uh, so we have this $2,000 uh, grand prize spades tournament where we're actually going to be talking with New Georgia Project about voting and um, um, all, all sorts of great things and making sure everybody's registered, you know what the issues are at stake um, on, our, uh, on our ballots in the coming months, actually next month, because uh, uh, mail-in ballots will be coming in, in just a few weeks. But... Um, Right now, I want to let's let's give um, Richard and 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 Kathy and Judith, Deborah, all of our presenters, uh, a round of applause. We're gonna give you a round of applause now. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Allison, so much. Allison, um, and 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 who uh, just left early? Uh, Claire. Claire. Thank you. Yes, thank you all so much. This, this, this was excellent. This was very, very, very much needed. Don't be surprised if you get an invite now to a, a council meeting to talk about <laughs> um, in depth. And, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and dismiss you all. The rest of you all stay around for a few minutes. I'm gonna take some questions, uh, just general questions. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not gonna be answering open records questions. But if you have questions about things that are going on in the city, um, you can go ahead and ask those questions now, and I'm going to go back to our technical uh, uh, tech one. He's got some questions, so we'll start with uh, those questions. Okay, um, the first question is, um, and bear with me, when is someone going to address the cost of living has gone up? And we were taught in school that when the cost of living goes up, so does our pay, no matter what job position we hold. You all keep saying to vote, but for what? They all seem to lie to just get a vote. I think that everyone needs to care that is in office and not just about themselves. Also forget spending all that money on speed bumps and fix all the potholes first and not just temporarily uh, and put a time frame also on how long it takes them to fix it. Because other than those workers, everyone else is just getting all the taxpayers money, but not necessarily doing the work. All right, well, thank you so much for that. Uh question and statement. 
I'm going to work our way. I'm going to work my way backwards. Um, and I am going to just, you know, I like to have my research and my slides and everything up, but here, we'll do it together. I am, give me one second, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Here we are. So I am on the City of South Fulton's website, cityofsouthfultonga.gov. All of our departments are listed here under government. This is where the mayor and the council are and the boards and commissions. Everything else is under departments. I'm going to go to our public works department. And under public works, you will see a whole bunch of things that the site is still getting built out. But one is TSPLOST. So TSPLOST stands for Transportation Local Option Sales Tax. Um, the Transportation Local Option Sales Tax is the percentage of the sales tax that we, you all agree to this one cent sales tax, right, for the city of South Fulton. And we use that on transportation projects. Here you can see a list of all the TSPLOS projects for the first five years. So we do these projects every, um, we, we, we renew these things in five year increments. I'm gonna see if the, the total is at the bottom, right? So, so we had three, and we put them in three tiers of projects, right? Tier one is the emergencies must do, tier two, tier three. Our public works director, Antonio Valenzuela, um, they go out and look at all the streets and they decide these are the ones that are the most important. Uh, these are the ones that must be done now. They they have a, a rubric and a set of sort of scientific measurements that they use to decide whether something is in tier one, tier two, um, or tier three. I will tell you the tier three projects we very rarely get to. Obviously we always have more projects than money. But what I will say is if you look at the bottom, there were $80 million of projects over the first five years. There will be some numbers similar to that over the next five years because we have, um, we have re-upped our TSPLOS as voters, not us as council, but as voters, we voted in 2021 um, to do another five years of TSPLOS. So if you don't see your street on this list, you uh, may, uh, call me, write me. Uh, my phone number is 404-545-3900. Um, you can also just contact me at Khalid at KhalidCares.com. I will put that in the chat. and. Let's make sure that if your street or your subdivision, these are subdivisions that were on the list for the first five years. If we missed you and we need to get you on the list for the next five years, let's make sure um, that we do that. By contrast, the speed bumps budget is only $1 million. So 1 million, 80 million. To date, we have only, installed one speed bump that well, well two speed bumps in one neighborhood um uh, a, a guy named drew demand uh, who's actually uh, uh running for city council now really worked with our previous city council person for district seven mark baker and really pushed for these speed bumps uh to be installed in his rural community uh you can contact my public advocate uh, Yusuf Otway, I will put his information in the chat. It is uh, public advocate at uh, cityofsouthfultonga.gov. Um, if you're interested in getting speed bumps um, in your neighborhood, that is a, that is a great place uh, to start. But I, I, I so I want to, I want to, because there were there was a loaded question. They talked about a couple things, but the the beginning of the question was really about the price of everything going up. And that's something that we've been talking about on council. And so I want to talk about three things that we've done 
as a city council to be sensitive to that? Number one, we did not raise taxes. Uh, I think that we only raised taxes once in five years. Um, but I can tell you that we did not raise taxes. Now, that does not mean that your property taxes will not go up. We did not raise the tax rate. But as we pave all of these streets and lower our response time for fire and police, and you know, do all of these other wonderful things, pick up trash more, um, invest in, in these building projects in our city. We've got a great project, Westwood, coming um, to District 1. You know, we built out these public shopping centers in a lot of different places. As we improve the city, the value of your home is going to go up, right? Um, and a lot of people have said, we want these amenities that they have in Sandy Springs or Peachtree City or you know, I go to these other places and they, they have these nice things. Well, when we get them, the value of your house is going to start looking more like those other places. I don't think that we'll, we'll ever be as high as um, Sandy Springs or Peachtree City, hopefully, right? But um, as we make these improvements, the, the value does go up. But three things that, that we've done as a city, one is we, we haven't uh, raised property taxes again this year. We're not raising the we're not raising the millage rate, so we're not raising the rate at which we we tax you. And there is a there is a homestead exemption, and we also have um, an exemption that everyone voted on. We put this on the ballot that the assessed value of your home, if it goes up more than three percent we won't tax more than three percent right so we can only um raise those those taxes three percent per year uh, so that that's something that we put in place the next thing that we put in place is uh a, a resolution that i introduced to raise the minimum wage from 15 dollars an hour to 20 dollars an hour we pay really well in the city of south fulton there are there are only i can't remember if it was 23 or 32 but there are only a couple dozen and we have like over 500 employees at this point there were only a couple of people, and it might have been 11. Uh, we can go back and, and, and roll the tape, but there, there's only about a dozen or so folks in the city that are making less than $20 an hour now. They're making maybe 19, right? So we, we, are, we are raising the wages in our city, and what we're hoping is that that puts upward pressure on the job market. You can always go to on um, um at the bottom of the page, I always have a, a link where you can see our open job listing. So if you're not making uh, 15 to $20 an hour where you are, you might want to look at um, the city of South Fulton and you might want to look at some of the jobs and things that we have. And the, uh, I said that there were three things. I think I've said, I think I've said three things, but, 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 but the raising of the wages um, and, and and trying to keep costs affordable are things that we are greatly concerned about. Oh, and the la the last one is, and again, there there when we raise wages or when we offer things for our employees, currently state law says that we cannot raise the wages anywhere but in for our own employees. In some states, right, like in Seattle. Um, in Washington state, Seattle has raised the minimum wage for all the workers in the city. In California and New York, they've raised the minimum wage for all the workers in the city because they don't have what's called preemption laws. But currently, um, our Republican control, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm saying what it is, our Republican control state legislature has made it illegal for us to raise the wages outside of city hall and they've also made it illegal for us to put rent control on apartments right so um even on, on even on old national uh the former biscaynes and now beacon ridge uh their one bedrooms are going for thirteen hundred dollars uh one bedrooms along cascade and those apartments they're going for fourteen to sixteen hundred dollars so we see that going up everywhere so one of the things that i would ask you all to do is to actually keep voting and if the if wages are not rising to meet inflation if housing costs um 
or rental costs are rising faster than your wages? These are questions that you need to ask uh, the governor candidates, um, the congressional candidates, the people that are on the ballot show up to these forums. Oftentimes, they are either having forums on YouTube, even the folks in Congress, right? Um, they are having forums on YouTube or they're having in-person forums where you can show up and ask them, will you commit to raising the minimum wage in Georgia? Will you commit to uh, offering rent control? Will you, will you commit to spending more of these American Rescue Plan funds um, on households making less than $100,000? You know, whatever it is, whatever the ideas are that you have, ask the people uh, that are asking for your vote to make some commitments um, to you and then hold them accountable to those commitments. Sorry for that long answer. Okay, uh, next question. Do we have another question, Tech One? I'm going to look in the. Yeah, yes, we do. Um, this one is regarding bids. Uh, for example, the citywide sanitation program where various companies submitted their bid for, the, for this contract. Can a person obtain the contract that was approved for the bid along with all the other companies that submitted their bid for this project? All right, let's ask, ask give me that last sentence one more time. Can a person obtain the contract that was approved for the bid along with all the other companies that submitted their bid for this project? Yes. Uh, while we're on the subject of open records, yes. So we are currently in the bid to provide citywide sanitation service. Anyone right now can file an open records request to see which companies bid, how much they bid for, you can see that entire bid. That is, that is available by open records request. We have not um, done a contract. So what is going to happen is we're, we're, we're evaluating the bids. There's actually a, 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 a team of people um, I believe it's the city manager, the director of public works, and then a sanitation industry professional are going to look at the bids. They're going to score the bids, and then we can uh, then council will vote on you know who our vendor or vendors for citywide sanitation will be. After that, we'll then present the vendor with a contract and one of the the contract once it has been developed will also be subject to open records request and it will be voted on in a public meeting so at least three days before that meeting hopefully about five to six days before that meeting I'll have a newsletter and it'll also be on the city's website, uh, the entire agenda for that meeting. So uh, around three to five days before every meeting and our meetings are on second and fourth Tuesdays, our voting meetings are on fourth Tuesdays. So um, either the fourth Tuesday in October or the fourth Tuesday in November, um, a few days before that, the contract will be up on the website and it'll be in my newsletter. Again, you can text Fulton to 33777 to get that newsletter. Pour over that contract. Uh, there are, there is a, 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 I'm gonna shout out Connie Robinson and um, her amazing group of uh, residents. It's, it's a coalition of HOAs across the city. And they've actually made several recommendations for contracts. You don't actually have to wait until um, you see the contract to make your recommendations. If you have recommendations, you can contact me at Khalid at KhalidCares.com. Uh, some of the some of the recommendations that that really stood out to me uh, were 
having a set of penalties for having a set of penalties or fines up up until losing the contract or or, or being kicked off the contract for um, missed pickups or trash that's left in the street or, or just general complaints, right? So uh, the recommendation was that, you know, if, 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 if company A gets 500 complaints or gets 100 complaints in 30 days, they should receive a fine or they should, um, they should lose the contract. We didn't really have any teeth like that in our previous contracts, and that's something that's been asked for. So if there are other, um, if there are other recommendations that you have, please get those to me. Um, we, uh, uh, Miss Roberts is asking in the chat if we can offer recycling solutions. So the current vendors that we have now all offer recycling you know for an additional fee there was some conversation about requiring recycling uh, you know citywide i'm a big supporter of that we only have one planet and uh beyond basic environmentalism you should know that most of america's landfills are in black and brown communities so every time you throw something in the trash it's probably coming back to a landfill near you right um but there didn't seem to be in our citizen surveys a huge interest for recycling and to create a citywide sanitation program would be more expensive than just creating drop-off sites. And so to, to that question that Ms. Ms. Roberts asked, one of the things that I've been pushing for is we have these um, uh, bulk trash collection days at Merck Mile and, and, and Creole Road. What we're talking about is putting recycling centers in some of our parks and some of our facilities so that people who are interested in recycling can drive hopefully somewhere not too far in their neighborhood uh, to do their recycling. That's also just something, that's also a, a, a what do I wanna say? It's a first step in a, in a process of creating a culture of recycling because one of the things that can happen is say we, we give everybody um, recycling bins, but only 50% of the people use them properly. The other 50% of the people throw in food waste or just whatever things that can't be recycled. Well, if you have if, if half of the stuff in the recycling truck isn't recyclable, then the truck, the whole truck has to go to a landfill, right? So um until we've reached a tipping point where a majority of people that are getting the recycling bins would use them properly. It, it, it isn't necessarily cost effective, but we are going to try and get those um, uh, in as many places as possible. And you can, Mr. Mack, uh, get a list of all code violations for a particular apartment community or for a particular address. Uh, all you have to do is file an open records request. I'm going to just go here again. I'm gonna share my screen and show where you can uh, find that open records request. I'm gonna back out of here, go back to, how do I? And it's right there on the homepage as well. Open records request, right? Uh, let me see if it's on our home homepage. Right there, it's right there on our homepage. Uh, first, first item. They're always changing our page. I think it's really great that we that we got it right here. Uh, and so you just click on that. It'll take you to another page where you will file an open records request. Now, if you think that you're being charged too much, uh, there is a link in the chat where you can report that to the attorney general. 
and and we've heard about a lot of other great resources but here is our open records request page so you can see that all right i'm going to take one more question and then i have got to run to the space tournament so those of you all who want to come out we are having this amazing uh spades tournament tonight uh it's being sponsored by uh the new georgia project and the grand prize winner is going to let me share my screen again the grand prize winner is going to get two thousand dollars is a two thousand dollar grand prize uh so if you want to come out and see uh the the kings of spades in on the south side uh battle it out i'll be headed there it is at blue marlin bistro which is formerly the crow's nest uh, 545, I'm sorry, um, 5495 Old National Highway. Uh, and I'll put that in the chat. Do we have one more question? Uh, tech one. I don't have anything else uh, that was sent in anyway. Okay, I'm going to check here in the chat. Recycling for uh, uh, Merck Road again, that is something. Will there be a tax increase when we move to city provided? No, so there is no, uh, again, we are not raising the millage rate. So I, I, wanna, I wanna be clear, your, if your property taxes go up, it is because the value of your entire house went up, which is always a good thing. But again, it should not go up more than it, your, your, your homestead the place where you live and and go to sleep at night should not r rise more than three percent now if you got multiple homes in south fulton or you got multiple homes in atlanta and you just got a vacation home or you're or ha a part-time residence here that value may go up more than three percent but uh the the property values and your your property taxes are not supposed to go up more than 3%. That that assessed value of your home, even if it goes higher than 3%, your property taxes shouldn't. So we are not raising the millage rate uh, to pay for this uh, citywide garbage collection. But again, you can text the word Fulton to 33777 to sign up for uh, my newsletter. And I I typically send alerts out the same way you got a text message about tonight's meeting. Um, when we're talking about these issues, you'll get a text message. You can click on it. You can watch it live. You can also go to uh, the city of South Fulton's YouTube page, which I believe is just youtube uh, youtube.com slash city of South Fulton. Or you can just put city of South Fulton in the YouTube search engine and you will find the page. All right. Um, I want to thank, uh, the members of the South Fulton Coalition and and and, and all the members of the community uh, who really pushed to make sure that this conversation happened. Um, I'm going to make sure that we have a part two so we can hear about the social media. If this was helpful uh, or insightful, please, please, please share this with your uh, friends and neighbors. They can watch it on ColleagueCares.com. It's also on my 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 Facebook page, which is Kali Cares USA, and we'll make sure that we get it in the in the newsletter. Thank you all so much, South Fulton, forever.